Ladies and gentlemen, let's do this. So what we're looking at is Soam Jennings. His title, The Objections to Taxation Considered. So really what he's doing is he's considering the opposite arguments. If we look at our three questions that we need to try and figure out for Soam Jennings, they're asking us three very, very somewhat difficult to understand, but really clear things. One, what arguments does Joanne refute concerning Parliament's right to tax the colonies? In this case, refute is what does he fight against? What is he angry at? What arguments are the colonists making that he thinks are absurd? Well, let's look. Like all things, this is organized in a way that we can read it. In his first two paragraphs, he sort of states his basic idea. And he says that it is so indisputably clear that the colonists should be taxed. And then he goes on to argue why. And it's mainly based upon money. Now, what arguments does he refute? First, then, that no Englishman is or can be taxed by his own consent as an individual. This is an argument he's refuting. So for number one, I want to be sure that I understand this. Now, secondly, no Englishman can be taxed but by the consent of those persons whom he has chosen to represent him. In addition to saying that every person should be taxed, he's also saying that everyone should be taxed regardless of they have representation. He's refuting this idea. He's refuting the idea that just because you don't have representation that you can't be taxed. He's laughing at the colonists. Lastly, he brings up this idea of what's called parliamentary representation, which means that you have a majority of people who are represented by several other people. In this case, he says, they should be taxed too. The argument that no Englishman is or can be taxed, he says, is absurd. So now we have something relatively interesting. Again, going back to his first question, we see that he is refuting three arguments. They're in the bottom three paragraphs on the first page. Now, Argument, or I'm sorry, question number two. What arguments does Jennings make that taxes may be levied without the consent of the governed? Now, in this case, we're really looking for what arguments is he making that taxes can be given to, taxes, taxes can be imposed on everybody without their permission. Well, let's see what he says. He says very, very clearly, and I quote, at the end of all of these arguments, he makes something very, very clear. After he refutes the arguments, he says, no man that I know is taxed by his own consent. He's essentially saying that every single person has to pay taxes. Ladies and gentlemen, remember, there are two things in life. One, death. Two, taxes. Those are the only things that we all get to do. Now, after he refutes the second argument, where do you think he makes his argument? Right here. He says quite clearly, in a jokingly way, when he talks about producing cider, that every single Englishman gets to pay taxes with or without representation. He goes on to make that argument even further. He says every Englishman is taxed, and not one in 20 is represented. Now, I want to assume this. Let's assume that you are watching this video right now and you're looking at all of this and you're like, Mr. Naus, I have no idea what's happening. Guess where you should go? To the very, very last page. Like all amazing primary sources, this primary source gives you So M. Jennings' arguments one by one. We see his five arguments laid out very, very clearly in front of us. You can use these five arguments not only to understand the text, but also you can use these five arguments to answer question number two. Now, how does Jennings repudiate the argument that America is exempt from taxes imposed by the authority of the parliament? Well, for this what we want to do is we want to go back to Jennings' second page here. And he says something very, very interesting. And again, if I'm looking down here, this is the second page in your handout, it's page 25 here. He says this really, really interesting idea, and he has something that talks about this idea of representation. And he talks about, is it an imaginary line? I mean, think about it. If you are living in England 
you have heard the ideas of Locke and other Enlightenment philosophers, and everyone talks about this idea of representation. Even if you are in Manchester, which is not close to London, or Birmingham, which is even farther from London, those people are technically represented. So if representation goes 300 miles, why not 3,000? Interesting argument. He repudiates the fact that America thinks that they don't have to be taxed because they're far away when really they're still British citizens. Remember what he says. Nobody gets to determine whether or not they are taxed. You are taxed because you're alive. Every man, for no man that I know, is taxed by his own consent. Everyone pays taxes. Everyone dies. Interesting proposition. With that information you should be able to answer all three questions. Now, just to review very, very quickly, I can find the answers to question number one on the bottom three paragraphs on the first page. I can find the answers to questions number two in the second part of those same paragraphs, or I can go down to the very, very end. I can answer question number three by going to the second page of Soam Jennings' arguments and looking very, very clearly at some of his specific points on the distance of an individual. And there's also another argument down here that I know that you can try and figure out on your own. Moving on to the very, very last page, which you also need to complete. Soam Jennings makes his five arguments. And now what we need to do is we need to find William Pitt's five arguments. So let's go piece by piece here into William Pitt, and now he's going to make the opposite argument. Now remember, this is one year later. William Pitt is also a British citizen. He also lives in London, but he actually supports this idea that the colonies shouldn't be taxed without representation. So let's see why. He is giving his speech here to the British Parliament, so imagine him kind of speaking up in front of all of his fellow British gentlemen. Now, he makes something, this a very, very interesting idea here. He says, I rejoice that America has resisted. Three million people, so dead to all feelings of liberty, as voluntarily to submit to be slaves, would have been fit instruments to make slaves of the rest. What he's essentially saying here is that the British people, as a people, have colonies all over the world, and they themselves would never submit to this, so why would they expect their fellow British citizens living in America to submit to this? It doesn't make any sense. They're all still from the same country. They're just living in a different area. So he's saying, I'm actually glad that America is resisting. On a more specific point, what you need for your second idea is the difference between what William Pitt notes as external and internal taxes. Now, this is a really, really fascinating thing. He is defining a difference between external and internal, and what does he mean? He says there is a plain distinction between taxes levied for the purpose of raising a revenue. In this case, those taxes are internal. And duties imposed for the regulation of trade. Those are external. For the accommodation of the subject. Now, essentially what he's saying is this. Internal taxes is what you would tax British subjects living in England. External taxes is what you would tax people living in the colonies. But what you would do is you wouldn't tax them. You would try and make money through trading with them. It's more of a business proposition, and it's more fair. He goes on to make his third point here in this paragraph. And through the first part of this third paragraph, he is essentially making a personal experience argument. He says that my materials were good as I was pains to collect, to digest, to consider them, and I will be bold to affirm that the profits to Great Britain from trade of the colonies through all its branches is <gasps> two million a year. That's a crazy amount of money at this time. This is the fund you carried triumphantly through the last war. So he's telling the British people, look, you were externally taxing the people in the colonies, and you made two million pounds. Why do you need to tax them internally? You owe this to America. Huh, this is a fascinating argument. So now he's drawn this difference between our internal and our external taxes. He's giving 
praise to external taxes because he's saying that you made money from them, so why would you go and try and take money from the internal parts? Pretty interesting argument. Now, in addition to the third argument, you also need to be able to say this. You have prohibited where you ought to have encouraged. Encouraged where you ought to have prohibited. He's essentially saying, you have stopped them from trading, which you should have encouraged, and now you've taxed them when you should have encouraged them to trade. You could have made money in a different way. It would have seemed more fair to the colonists, and now you've chosen to do it opposite. What do you expect would happen? So now this is a really, really fascinating point that he comes to. He talks about the force of this country, of England, can crush America to atoms. So now he's praising England and he's saying, look, we are the strongest country. I know the valor of your troops. I know the skill of your officers. England is the strongest army in the world. However, if you attack America, your success would be hazardous. America, if she fell, would be like a strong man. She would embrace the pillars of the state and pull down the Constitution with her. This is a really fascinating argument. He's now saying these are also British subjects. If you attack them, it, they will fight you. If we were attacked, we would fight back. They're, they are us. So why, explain to me, would you quarrel with yourselves? And then he goes on to point out, why would you quarrel with yourselves now that the House of Bourbon is united against you? If you remember from our 30 years war unit, we now know that the House of Bourbon, which originally was connected to Spain, is now connected to France. And France is now technically controlling Spain through the monarchy because of the family, the bloodlines. So now you have France and Spain against England. Why would England start a war with the United States over taxes? You now have your fourth argument. The fifth argument that you need to try and figure out is, a, is the very, very last sentence. Think about this. He is essentially telling his fellow British citizens, look, we have extended every point of legislation. We have binded their trade. We've confined their manufacturing. And we've exercised every power. Except we are now trying to take money out of their pockets without asking them. He is arguing for taxation without representation. And that is his final and fifth argument. So again, just so that we're clear, I've talked about these five arguments. If you go back to this page, you will note that we need to have an argument. This is a fifth argument. So over here, fifth argument, fourth argument, third argument, second argument, and first argument. If you didn't understand anything that I've said, that's the great part that this is a video. You should go back, listen to it, and watch it as many times as you need to. And as always, remember, you know that you can do this. You are able to read these things. You probably just have to try a few times harder than some other people. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Naus dictating and highlighting Soam Jennings' argument against, or I'm sorry, for taxation, and also William Pitt's arguments against taxation. Thank you so much.